We're going to read together Psalm 47, Psalm 47, verses 5 to 9. Psalm 47, verses 5 to 9. One, two, three. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with the psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, deliver us from any stupor, any confusion, any distractions, and help us focus on the pure meat of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jenna. Yes, so we, uh, we've been going through books of the Old Testament, and um, we have crossed over Job, the 40-some chapters of Job, and now we're moving into the book of Psalms. But I want to take a, a whole comprehensive uh, look at the, the entirety of the book of Psalms. So as you know, there are multiple Psalms but we call it the book of Psalms. There are 150 Psalms. And the one I just read to you is an example of uh, what they are like. Um, it is expressive. It is as if it were a song. It's a praise. It comes flowing out of the heart. And in many cases, there's some cases, the Psalms not only are meant to be sung, they're meant to be sung as poetry, but they're also meant to be shouted. And I think this is one of them. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Right? That it is interactive with our soul. It is powerful. It's passionate. So we can study the book of Psalms, but to derive it only as a theological approach is dead. It will have no, it's not what the intended purpose is for the book of Psalms. It is something we use, something that we feel, something that we express and sing. Uh, the Jews, it is the Jewish hymn book. That's what it's referred to, or that's what it's called. Um, the actual word for that is Tehillim. So they don't call it the book of Psalms, they call it Tehillim which means praises. And you'll see that in the Psalms, in, there are many times that the beginning of a Psalm is a little kind of like an introductory uh, phrase that explains what was going on at the time when the person wrote it. Um, for instance, David wrote almost half of the Psalms. He didn't write all of them. And it's, in one case, I can remember the time where David feigned insanity to get away from his enemies. and. Uh, one of the psalms proceeds like that. There's also uh, David's psalms that he wrote uh, when he sinned and uh, with Bathsheba. Um, and that would uh, relate to Psalm 51. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, David wrote, as I said, about 73 of these psalms. Uh, there's another group of authors called the Sons of Korah who wrote... 11 Psalms, and another group called the Sons of Asaph, and they wrote 12 Psalms. So I don't know if it's one or several of these uh, brothers. And then you also have one Psalm by Moses, Psalm 90, the, which is the oldest Psalm. It's about 3,500 years old. There are 50 anonymous Psalms that we don't know who the author was. And uh, Psalm 72 was written by King Solomon. He may have written one other one. He-Man wrote one, and he was a singer in the temple. Ethan wrote one. And all the authors were priests and Levites except for David, Moses, and Solomon. So, uh, as I said, uh, the oldest one being written by Moses was about 4,000 3,500 years ago. Most of them are in that 3,000 year range. I mean, when you're reading these things, doesn't that fascinate you? 
But you, you read them just like they're just written yesterday. But God speaks, the same spirit speaks through those words uh, as, as Moses would have been reading it, uh, in his case, over 3,000 years ago. There is not one book of Psalms. It's divided into five books. The first book of Psalm, and you'll no, only notice that if you look at the top uh, at the beginning. So like if you go to Psalm 1, in that on that page it'll say book 1. And that comprises Psalm 1 to 41. Book 2 is Psalms 42 to 72. And book 3, Psalms 73 to 89. Book 4, Psalm 90 to 106. And book 5, Psalm 107 to 150. Elohim is mentioned most often in Psalms 42 to 72. So that would be book two. And Yahweh is mentioned uh, mostly in books one, four, and five. So Elohim is, does anybody remember? It's a plurality of God, but it, the way they reference it in the Bible, in the, in the context of a sentence, it's one God, but it's referring to actually three. So Elohim is actually three. There's another word for two, and that's not the word that they use. So Elohim is referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, this trips up the apostolic people. Uh, when you go to baptize someone in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're actually baptizing them in the name of Elohim, the three in one. And um, the uh, Yahweh, the way it's constructed, there are three parts to Yahweh, and one means past, present, and future. Uh, why the book of Psalms is divided up that way in references to God, I don't know. But I wanted you to know, because when we read it, we read it in English. And we, we don't know what these references are. So the Jews have us on that. They have a, a direct understanding, at least of the constructs of, of these, these words. So I said the oldest Psalm is 90, written by Moses. The newest one is Psalm 137. And how do we know that? I had to ask myself. So I, it's actually about... Uh, post-exile, when the Jews were exiled to Babylon, uh, if you remember, uh, by, uh, they're there by Nebuchadnezzar, and, and then they returned, as we talked about with Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back to reconstruct the walls, and they reconstructed the temple, and that period of time would have been close to 600 years B.C., and the finishing of the second temple was about up to about 516 BC. So we know that that psalm was written after that time period. Why do you care about this? Because you ought to know what the heck you're reading. <laughs> and if you were to talk to a well-educated Jew, you wouldn't know the first thing about the book of Psalms. You would just say it's the book of Psalms. But the Jew could probably tell you there are five books. Did you know that Yahweh is mentioned, blah, 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 and Elohim? And you look like you don't know anything, and so why should I listen to you about Jesus? So we want to be a little bit educated. You don't have to be a scholar, but to have an idea of what your Bible is all about. And, um, but the principal purpose of Psalms is to be used. And it is not just to be studied. It is to be sung. It is to be used as prayers of contrition. In fact, you could say there are about 13 categories of psalms, that you, but there are similar elements across most of the psalms. So you can't just say this psalm is in this category and that psalm is in that category. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. There are hallelujah and praise songs. That is the principal purpose of some of these psalms. I, uh, it's an emphasis on the name of God, the majesty of God, the greatness of God, the salvation of God. That would be Psalms 821, 33, 34. You can go look them up yourself, of course. Um, I pulled out Psalm 33, 1 to 9, just to give an example here. Shout for joy in the Lord. Oh, right. Oh, you righteous. Praise befits the upright. How can you read this without expressing passion? And in fact, they're meant to be read out loud, not to just be you know, silently uh, read. They're meant to be read as a whole, that you would read the entire song. And in fact, they're usually meant to be played with stringed instruments, as Brian was doing today. And I was thinking, you know, when Jesus and the apostles were at the Last Supper, it said they finished the meal, 
And then they sang a hymn, and then they went out uh, to, to the uh, Mount of Olives. And actually, at that point, I'm not, I think Judas probably had already departed, because if you'll remember, he takes the Passover bread and he gives it to Judas and dips it into the, the bitter herbs, and then he takes that and he says, whatever you need to do, go do it quickly. And then Judas departed, which was to turn in Jesus to the enemies uh, of the Jewish council. The Jewish council who are the enemies of Jesus. And then, but they sang a hymn. Where'd they get the hymn? I'm positive it was out of the book of Psalms. It doesn't say which one. And they only sang one. I always found that interesting. <laughs> the Last Supper. And they didn't have like this long song fest they didn't go to um you know patriot center and listen to uh, what's our michael w smith or whatever and listen to the whole concert they, they had jesus they had relationship they had just seen so many miracles and jesus was teaching them about the kingdom of god and and he's he's intimate with them it's like it's like this here i mean that's the size of our first church basically the and then John is hanging out on Jesus. He's leaning on him. I mean, is this, the whole religious system is just being decapitated. And all of these psalms originally were sung at the temple and sung in, in a beautiful setting. I mentioned He-Man, who is a, one of the leaders of the singers. The, these families, these patriarchs would have certain responsibilities among the Levites, and some of them would play instruments and some would sing, and that was their job. And they would wear beautiful uh, robes like priests, and it was well organized and structured. And when they sung these psalms with the power of the Holy Spirit and with a real heart connected to it, the Holy Spirit fell. If you remember, Solomon built that grand temple, and he prays, and there's an offering, and God releases the fire from heaven and it hits the altar. And then the presence of God is so strong, the priests cannot stand. That happened in my basement one time where I used to worship all the time. And people couldn't even stand. I, I told you the story. My mother came downstairs and she said, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and she just fell down, on, gently fell down on the ground. And if you worship like that with your heart, with passion, and a real connection to God, his presence will always show up. But I want to draw a distinction here. Because where these psalms were originally sung is no more. That structure has been torn down and Jesus prophesied it would be. With no tears in his eyes. Tear this temple down and in three days I will rebuild it. And where did they sing the last hymn before Jesus before Jesus' um, crucifixion. Not in the temple. In an upper room. Some guy's house. One hymn. One meal. One moment with the Savior. Intimate. Personal. And they're whispering at each other. He's talking about someone betraying him. Is it me? <laughs> Who is it? But they know each other and they're looking at each other and thinking, eh, and it turns out it's Judas. But Jesus is at the meal table with them. I, I, I've talked about this, you know, Jesus had bodily functions like we do. And he went on these long journeys walking around. There's no porta potty out there. You, you got to know this. I mean, he had to find a bush. <laughs> He's not so... Far off. I mean, this is the amazing thing about God. That he'll hang out with you and me. He understands us. I, I find that phenomenal. And he can't take a shower every day. They would put oil in the hair, you know, and try to look a little bit presentable. But there's got to be a body odor there. You know, there's got to be stench, man. And it doesn't bother him. He doesn't bother that John's hanging out on him, this young guy. This is completely different. But the Psalms don't change. The structure and the religious system changed, but not the Psalms, not the expression of anybody who wants to cry out to God. These Psalms were written for an individual to use. And they're also written for a group to come like in a festival, like Passover, 
Psalms 113 to 118. They're used in the Passover. So a group will sing, them, uh, will sing them together. And Feast of Tabernacles, they have psalms that they use. And, and those, those called for feasts in the Old Testament. And they would do it all together. But if you're not doing it individually, it doesn't do any good. The group may be reciting and singing. But if your heart is not connected to it. Can you imagine if you're in that little group with Jesus at the Last Supper? And all these other guys are just loving Christ and, and they're talking and they're hanging out and they're remembering all the great times they had together and all the demons they cast out, all the people they got healed. Do you remember that time? And, and, and Jesus, remember you, you, you told that joke about them? I don't know about that. And Peter, remember that, that fisherman joke you had? It was off color. It was, it was naughty. But... but they can sing this song, but you would if you couldn't sing that song, I bet Judas couldn't sing this song with his heart. He wasn't in love with Jesus. And I think that's why he departs before they sing the last hymn, if he did depart. But you would feel out of place. And that's a warning sign to us. If I don't feel connected to Jesus... Even, you know, when the group's singing together or praising God. It's a warning sign. It doesn't mean you're, you know, it means you got something to do, something you need to take care of. And there was a time when David felt that way. But he never stopped his personal communication with God. So I mentioned there, you could categorize these psalms roughly in 13 categories. We have hallelujah and praise songs. We have thanksgiving songs like Psalm 18, and here's one of these preceding uh, introductions. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, so this is the day, he wrote this psalm about the day that God delivered him and saved him from persecution by King Saul. I love you, O Lord, my strength. He's not just writing a book to sell on Amazon. Do, do, do we have that clear? He's not trying to make money by selling a song on, you know, whatever the, the publishers are nowadays for songs. He's writing it because he's writing it to God because he saved his life. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of shoal entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. Do you feel the passion and the power? And if you pray this prayer, as if you wrote it in your hour of need. God will open up a new dimension in your prayer life, and in a new dimension of how you communicate to God. That's what these things are for. And if you can sing it, all the better. Now, these were written in Hebrew, so when we try to take these as lyrics in English and then apply it, sometimes it's a little different. Actually, I have a song at the end that's based on Psalm 121, and there's a group called the Sons of Korah, that they've taken many of these psalms, if not all of them, and turned them into songs. And when you need help, see, these psalms are about desperation as well. It's about complete reliance on God. And remember, David was at that point, but this psalm is about thanking him. He didn't have time to sing while the enemy was coming at him. But afterwards, you know, he called, he does say, I called upon the Lord. He says that in multiple psalms. And you rescued me. You have to remember when you're in a bad situation and God rescues you, you don't attribute it to the doctor. I mean, thank God, maybe he's a good doctor. 
But ultimately, God sent you to that doctor. God gave wisdom to that doctor. You give praise to God for every good thing. When you get a good job, when you get a, a, a promotion, when you get into Cornell, it isn't just, I, you know, look at me. I'm, you know, I know you're nuts. But it's like, God, thank you. I praise you. It would be good to pull out Psalm 18 or something else and praise God. Psalm 103, we sang today. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And any song that talks about the goodness of God. If you don't know where to start praying, you have no excuse. God's already got them. Presets in the Bible that you can use as a jump start to get that thing going. And then you start praying in tongues because you've got the Holy Spirit. I love you, O Lord, my strength. And then you start singing. You pull out some of your favorite hits. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You start moving your body around. You start to dance a little bit. This is a new way to live and pray with God. That's what David did. The guy who wrote these psalms. It's not just some book. It's alive and it has power, but you have to unleash it. You have to use it. There another category, prayer and petition songs about grief, sorrow, a desire for God's presence. I think that's in most of these psalms. Psalm 5, for instance. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. If you are complaining, if you are in pain, if you are in fear, if you lack, if you don't know why someone doesn't love you and someone rejected you, why don't you pull this out and know that David went through the same thing that you did? Give ear. It says to the choir master for the flutes, a psalm of David. So he said, I wrote this for flute playing. I don't know what that would sound like. But give ear to my words. <laughs> oh, Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my king and my God, for you to you do I pray. Oh, Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. He'll hear it if you wake up and you pray to him. <laughs> He's not going to hear your voice if you don't pray in the morning. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. That's my time in the morning. That's when I sit down with the Bible and a cup of coffee. And I read the Bible and I pray. And in my hurriedness, I sing while I'm getting dressed. And I, that's my sacrifice to God before I start the day. And I thank him for everything he's done and the people in my life and ICF. And I pray for you guys. So I do that. Try to do it every morning. I, I can't, probably on one hand, I can count the times that I didn't to some measure do that. And even if I did, I'm doing it in the car. I, now at work, because I, I live so close, I don't have time to pray in the car. <laughs> God blessed me with a short commute. So, so I, 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 now I read the Bible at work. And I have a nice private section there, so nobody bothers me. So I pull out the Bible, and then... Um, but I. The verbal stuff I do in the car, I do at home. I pray in tongues in the morning. Um, and then, uh, you know, they'll <laughs> while I'm doing that and I'm eating my cereal, because I don't eat it in the morning anymore, because I, I can do it at work. So why waste time? At, <laughs> I don't know. So while I'm in there, I'm really quiet. And then eventually someone would say, Bill, are you all right? <laughs> Are you still there? Like, are you awake? <laughs> and then I'll, I'll start talking. And then we'll end up with some kind of Jesus conversation, usually in, in some form. You, you have to keep the integrity of your personal relationship with the Lord. And it's not like I'm planning what I'm going to talk to these guys about. But somehow I even get into the discussion on deliverance. And boy, that gets their attention, you know, and, and stuff like that. And then they start to listen to me. And I've, I've described to you how uh, my friend Joe has moved all the way to the point of praying before he eats. And, and, and the other day he said, you know, Bill, I'm, I'm 76. I'm looking forward to one, th one day, the good day, when God calls me home. Um, he said, that's all I want, a better place. I'm going to a better place. So I know I've gotten him, he's gotten to the point, God has gotten to the point where he's really developing this personal relationship with God, I can see it. And, it's, and he's sincere. He's not, he's not joking around. He's serious. Well, that's the whole point of the Psalms, if I can get back on track.
The whole point of the Psalms is that personal, real communication with God. Whether you're praising Him, thanking Him, or whether you're asking for help. Now, David, in Psalm 51, this is a famous one, to the choir master, O Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Had her husband killed. Now, many people, if, if this happens to any one of us, would want to just kick them out. You're worthless. You'll never be any good to God. You're, you're horrible. It's not a good thing. Let's, let's face it. This is awful. I, I mean, nowadays he'd be in, well, potentially be in jail. Who knows? The sliding scale of justice nowadays. Um, anyway, he should have been in jail for life. He murdered somebody and committed adultery. But because he has a repentive heart and a relationship with God, he writes a psalm. Would you write a song about your worst sin, sins? Would you write anything again to God? Would you ever think you could come to church or if you're a pastor to preach again or a worship leader to worship again or even want to come in, darken the, the door as you come into the church? If you committed adultery and murder, what David did. And he's not hiding it. He writes it in the Bible. I mean, God puts it in the Bible. He does it. And he sets it as a song that anybody can sing, including the whole Israel community. Have mercy on me, O oh God. See, you can be a complete dirt ball like he was, but he repented and he expressed his heart and he was transparent. He didn't hide it. And he was genuinely convicted of his sin. And he offers that up to you and to me. Because when you screwed up, you can look at him and say, even what I did wasn't quite that bad. Not that you want to do that, but I mean, it just shows to show you can go to the lowest level and you can still worship God. And you can still read what David wrote 3,000 years ago. Same kind of sins 3,000 thousand years ago. Have mercy on me, O God. There's no pride in this. There's no Christian arrogance or prosperity gospel. It is, I am a worm. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Now the key here is, you have to position yourself focused intimately on God. You don't just read this and say, God just forgave me, I'm good. Let's go get drunk. You have to sit there. You have to take time alone and intimately seek God and position yourself before Him and confess your sins. But do, look at how He really, He doesn't just do it flippantly. Oh, God, please forgive me. I committed adultery and had Uriah killed. You feel, okay. <clears throat> Wash me thoroughly. So why not use David's words? He's gifted as a psalmist to lead us in a prayer of contrition, a prayer of repentance. But only these psalms are only good if we activate our heart and allow the Holy Spirit to connect us to God. They do no good as just a Bible study. I mean, that's a starting point. But you can't leave it there. Okay, just the, the categories. Sacred history songs. The songs are also about God's work in the history of the Jewish people. Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion on the willows, there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required us of us songs and our tormentors mirth singing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So they had been captive as exiles. And there are others talking about their 
ex their release from uh, slavery in Egypt. Uh, enthronement of the Lord is a consistent theme. Worshiping at God's throne, that he's king. Liturgical songs that were used during feast, as I mentioned, Psalms 113 to 119 for Passover celebrations, for special ceremonies and feasts. Um, and there are other psalms. Trust and devotion, individual confidence in God's integrity, heartfelt devotion to God. This is what's lacking in those big churches that I gave you that example before I started to teach. It's all fluff. I mean, I hate to generalize, but that's just what I, you know. And then all of a sudden, your kids are 20, 21 years old, and they don't know the Lord, but they've been going to that church their whole lives and going to that Bible, uh, the, what do you call it, Sunday school? And they've never been convicted. They've never been told they have to repent of their sins and choose Jesus and only Jesus because they tried to make everybody happy and they don't want to talk bad about the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Jews and everybody else. They don't want to say that your king is alone. He is your only salvation. He is the Messiah. They don't want to draw a distinction between the rest of the world and God's family. And they don't want to hurt feelings because we just want to make you in, bring you in happy and you'll get to know God and have a little candy and a donut and a cup of coffee. You've got to bring the Holy Ghost. You've got to bring the power of conviction and you've got to see the deliverance, the power of God's deliverance. Demons have to come out of people periodically and uh, periodically people have to be stunningly healed or even over time, as in my case. But you can't just make everybody happy. The Psalms are convicting. The Psalms are passionate. The Psalms are distinct. And, and our relationship with God has to be that intimate, personal passion. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Pilgrimage songs. The Jews used to go back for these feasts every year from wherever they were. And Psalm 43 is an example. They would sing these songs while they were walking these long distances to go back to Jerusalem, to celebrate together the Passover and things like that. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill. That would be in Zion and Jerusalem and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. They're singing together, going together. And this is like us coming together on Sunday. You should have that song in your heart. I can't wait to get here and worship with Brian. I'm not joking about this. We want to come to the altar of God. We want to come to your presence. And I may be a little tired. I may be a little sick. I may be a little whatever. But I want to come. I'm a pilgrim going to, to the Lord together. One family. Psalm 48, 1 to 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. This is not the expression of God's almighty power and grandeur in these Psalms is beyond what we see. We are culture and society has brought God down to this little baby in a manger. It is not with this reverential respect that I put him first, that I honor him, that I seek him in my time of trouble, that I, that I give all thanks and glory to God, and that my heart is to join with him, even if I'm in Psalm 51, Bill, <laughs> even if I've completely blown it. God said I through Nathan to David when he sinned, he said, I have forgiven your sins. And I know David kind of changed. He was kind of moping after that. He knew he had sinned. But the point is that he was able to reestablish his relationship with God in a more humble manner, but he never broke. He never broke his relationship with God. And the Psalms teach us that. When you screw up, get back and sing to him. Don't be proud and arrogant and just, just, you know, just think your sins are not important. They are. But you need to... You need to recognize that even in your screwed upness, he is still listening and he still wants you. Your relationship doesn't have to end because of the disaster you've made of your life or whatever you've done. The Psalms also talk about creation. Psalms 8, 1 to 3, that God created everything. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? They also call for God's wisdom and instruction. And also, multiple places, they, re, they point to the Messiah, to Jesus. And Jesus refers to the Psalms at multiple times as well. 
Um, in fact, he says in Luke 24, 44, Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus said, read these Psalms. They are about me. And you can find multiple references about the crucifixion and how he felt on the day he was dying on the cross and his, the, the feeling of being rejected by those he loves. And if you've been rejected by people you love, go to, go to those Psalms that talk about Jesus' rejection. Well, we're running out of time, so you'll have to find those on your own. Um, but there, one last category of Psalms is that uh, uh, calling on a curse or a judgment on your enemies. Be careful with this one. You have to know it in the context of the way they're used. So don't just run around cursing everybody who cuts you off in traffic. That's a bad habit to get into. <laughs> but um, there are Psalms in there about this. So now if you're saying... These are enemies of God, and they're coming against you. Do you remember when Paul was uh, he was on one of the islands? It might have been Malta. I, I don't remember now. Um, but he's at the governor's residence, and he's witnessing to him. And then there's a magician, Bar-Jesus, who's standing there. And he used to uh, influence the governor. And he's trying to get him not to listen to Paul and the gospel. And Paul calls him a wicked man or whatever, and he curses him, and he brings a cloud of darkness on him and the guy was blinded so, you know you don't have to be friends with people that are enemies of the cross and there are times where you might want to do what he did uh, but you need the leaning of the holy spirit you're not just cursing people because you have a personal problem with them okay we're talking about sharing the gospel and people that are wicked and evil you know you can pray for their salvation but paul didn't pray for that guy's salvation he knew he was lost and he was interfering with the gospel so he cursed them um, I'll let you decide between God and yourself on that. Okay. So I love Psalm 103. And as we sang part of it today, bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Can we stop there and stand up and say this together? Out loud, please. So we're at Psalm 103. Do you want me to read it and then you say it after me or we do it together? What's easier for you? And then you say it. Okay. Responsive reading like I was raised in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> okay. On the count of three. One, two, three. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, Bless the Lord O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed.
He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. He made known his ways to The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, shout it. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, shout it. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you, God, for the power that are in them. We pray you unlock in us a passion of prayer and praise and that you help us use these books, use this book of Psalms to change our communication and relationship with you, that we're never so defeated and so down that we can't pull out the Psalms and cry out to you and activate our heart. Uh, our heart and the power of the Holy Spirit to remember as Psalm 103 says, how much you love us, the abundance of your love, your steadfast love, God. We thank you, God, for your ministering agents, the angels who come and minister to us while we praise you with these psalms. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, thank you for uh, this song in English, uh, reminding us how the psalms are supposed to be sung. and. Um, we pray you can connect us through your Holy Spirit to the power of praise like this. We pray a blessing over all of our brothers and sisters and uh, encouragement and the uplifting power of your love in the Holy Spirit. We also pray for the food we're about to eat and all those who cobbled it together, Tina's family, I believe, and yes. we pray you give us good, loving fellowship while we enjoy it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.